that's just one of the, the gems that uh, Doug Williams is going to bring to the table today. We also have Dr. Rock, who's going to be speaking as a primary source. I didn't tell him he was a primary source, but he is. <laughs> as the second generation, we also have the Molly McGuire's here today, Woo one all the way from Iowa. So we've got some other special guests, too, and I appreciate everybody coming today. So, um, oh, that's right, the clicker. Here we go. So I'm Anita Doring, and we've got Rick, Dr. Rock, um, Provisky, and then of course Doug Williams, and that's the order we're going to speak in today um, about the project. So it, we're documenting lacrosse's early rock and roll history, and I should have been doing this a long time ago, but I didn't, and Doug finally convinced me that I should do it, and I really have to thank Doug uh, for a lot of things. He uh, as a former lacrosse public library employee, he started our genealogy database way back when, uh, when it was only in-house. And after he left, of course, we kept migrating and migrating, and it's online. It's been online for, I think, over 20 years now. Um, so Doug was our first IT person before there was IT at the library. So I actually have a lot to, we all have a lot in gratitude to Doug for many things. One of the other things is he's a record collector and he'll talk about how he came into these um, tapes and then how he eventually convinced me that yes, we needed to really preserve these and do something with them. So, um, so part of my job as an archivist, of course, is to collect primary sources and that would be photographs, posters, or copies of them. Um, Oral history is a good part of that, especially for something like rock and roll, which was another reason why we kind of, I had been dragging my feet about it, plus the different formats of things. And it's very expensive, obviously, to migrate and then keep that material current and then to share it online. And we also have issues with copyright and licensing, too, when we come to music. Um, so it gets very complicated very quickly, and it was sort of an area that we had not really pursued. We had plenty of work as it was. Um, but I felt that this was the time we really needed to tackle this. So that's why I, that, that's my excuse for dragging my feet all of these years. So, um, and of course with these Lindy tapes, discovering them uh, as new materials and sharing them with everybody. And it also of course made Doug do an awful lot of volunteer work behind the scenes that he will be very gracious and not tell you about how many hours I'm sure he spent on this project. Okay, about Lindy Shannon. Um, I'm sure a lot of you know more about Lindy Shannon than I do, but I will share what just a, just a brief skeleton of, uh, of information about him. So he was a disc jockey, a record store manager, a local band promoter, and an agent, as well as being a weekly music columnist. And all of those things helped set up kind of the perfect storm in this case. Um, born in 1928 as Charles Lindbergh Shannon, he adopted the Lindy nickname. He quit school early, for he had some medical issues, and um, he had to make up a bunch of work at Lincoln Middle School, and he said absolutely not to enroll in high school, so he decided he was just going to quit school and start working, which he did. Um, and he started at, well, he had a job at a candy shop, and then went to Terry's Music Store on the 300 block of Main Street at the age of 16. Um, then he served at the United States Army from 1950 to 52, and then began his DJ career at WKTY, then moved to WLXCX, and finally to WKBH by the early 1960s. And DJs then were able to promote whatever records they felt would get a good reaction in their market, um, and that changed by the mid-1970s. Um, the radio format became much more standardized and streamlined, and no longer did the local DJ have as much control over the musical content that was uh, broadcast, and that also plays all into this. Lindy began working at Lightholz Music as record manager until they closed their record department in 1981. He was able to create and maintain local hit charts as well as keep on top of the nationally ranked hits. He was also able to buy and listen to the newest music releases from a wide variety of musical styles and amassed his own large record collection. Um, by the way, Lindy liked Bing Crosby and Lawrence Welk as we found out from the tapes and some other things. Uh, and one of the questions that Doug and I both noticed um, through the interviews, whenever he would interview someone, he would ask if they thought that rock and roll was here to stay or if it was just a fad. <laughs> so I think in his case, he's uh, probably happy it was more than just a fad. So um, He was active with uh, area musicians from roughly the mid-1950s to the mid-1970s, so that's kind of the focal uh, parameters of our project at this point anyway. 
and he often schooled uh, musicians on having them come and listen to selected songs from his vast collection. Uh, Shannon worked with Roger Gilbeck. I have to admit, I don't know much at all about Roger, so if you have any insight into that or what that relationship was, that'd be great. But under their name of Lindbeck, you'll often see that on the bottom of the promotional flyers and such. Um, that was the name under which he did promoting and booking of local bands with area venues. Uh, he was known as Mr. Music and he loved to help musicians. He could hear potential in them and in his words help to polish them up. He was, uh, in fact, at the perfect place to be able to do this at the perfect time. So all of those things in combination, the DJ, the music columnist, uh, the record store manager, um, and of course, what did Lightholt sell? But you know, recording devices and, and such. And so he was able to do some recording there. And I'm sure he did some at WKPH, but all of the stories I've heard have been connected to light holes, so that people would come and, and do that. Um, oops, there we go. So in 1956, Elvis came to La Crosse. Of course, he was also on national TV. And Lindy was, he did for two shows, Lindy was able to interview him um, in between the shows, and we have the original tape. Doug found the original tape from that. You can also find it on YouTube. Somebody has posted that up. It was on a record, an uh, LP as well, and, um, and that this image appears on that, on that record. So in between, if you've listened to the tape at all, um, you can hear the girls pounding on the doors, because this is between <laughs> shows. There were two shows. And there were others that also performed at the same time. And in the end, it was only a 26-minute uh, performance that Elvis had, but yet it had lasting effects on both um, not only musicians, but of course the, the young scene um, in lacrosse. So, And um, I'm almost done, don't worry. Um, Terry Tolson. I consider him the, the local historian of lacrosse's rock and roll history. Um, he's done a lot of work to preserve audio of different bands um, that were under Lindy in particular. He is a Lindy uh, product as well. He still continues to do performing and um, original compositions. He, you can follow him on YouTube. He's got quite a few things there. He's donated all of his material to us, which I'm still working through. Um, and again, we have some issues with you know music and licensing and whatever. But I am going to go ahead and show you. Um, we're going to jump out to a video that he did about the TJs, which are the first Lindy's first rock and roll band uh, with Jack Rubick. Um, and we actually have this one digitized too. So. Elvis had opened the floodgates. Rock and roll now dominates the pop charts that used to belong to our parents. And by now, it seemed like every other kid I talked to, including myself, owned a guitar. Still, lacrosse had no actual rock and roll band. But there were two older teens who already had stage experience. They were determined to get something going. Jack Robick and Tom Terry were juniors at Aquinas High School. They were able to pick up Bill Weigel on drums and Dwayne Schrader on rhythm guitar. They called themselves the TJs. Anxious to get started, they immediately set up an audition with Lindy Shannon. Lindy was impressed. So the TJs would spend the rest of the year making live appearances at all the Lindy record hops. But Lindy wouldn't stop there. He was determined to record this group. sifting through dozens of promo records, the TJs found one they could rearrange, and they called it Party Party. The flip side was written by Tom Terry called Take My Love. The closest recording studio at that time was K-Bank in Minneapolis. 
Lindy wasted no time in setting up a recording date. $500 for 500 records. Lindy put up half and the TJs came up with the other half. At first, it was believed that the TJs had put out the first rock and roll record in the state of Wisconsin, but later to find out that a group from Appleton called the Whitecaps put out rock and roll saddles a couple of weeks earlier. Party Party was printed on the Lindy label. It was released for sale on a Saturday afternoon with a Pepsi party at Lightholds, along with a TJ's autograph session. It was complete chaos. You couldn't even get in the store. Needless to say, they sold all 500 records that day. Party Party was the number one song in the Cooley region. The TJs became instant rock and roll stars in lacrosse and the surrounding area. Without a doubt, the first group that caught my attention here in the Cooley Region area were the TJs. I'll never forget the afternoon that Jack Roebuck came into the Light Piano Company, very shy and bashful as he is, and asked me if I would like to listen to a group of boys that he got together. They had just listened to many Elvis Presley and Gene Vincent recordings, and, well, they'd like to make a tape and see how they sounded. I thought it was a good idea, so that night, the three boys came into Light Homes. That would have been Jack Roebuck, Tom Terry, and Bob Petros. These boys uh, sat down, and we started to work the tape recorder, and one of the first numbers that they recorded was a tune called Don't Be Cruel, which was very big by Elvis Presley at the time. So there you go. That was a, a sample of uh, the beginning of Lindy's, uh, Lindy's wild career there with, with local bands and how it all started. Dr. Rock, Rick, was in the kind of what I would call the second wave of Lindy, our second generation of Lindy. So TJs are in that early group, the 50s, we have Elvis. And then who came along in the 60s was the British Invasion and the Beatles and whatnot, although Dr. Rock and his group started before the Beatles, but he can talk about that if he would like. Um, so let's, uh, let's hear about Dr. Rock and his extraordinary experiences. Yeah, 
Anita, what I'm most proud of is I can still get into this Marauder outfit. <laughs> now, if something happens, if something happens to me, I've got duct tape on. So don't, don't. I hope the ambulance drivers don't think I'm a weirdo or something. But you, you just got to do what you got to do. <laughs> but it's such an honor to be here, and thank you all for coming so much today, and for saluting just a wonderful man, Lindy Shannon. You won't meet one musician that just doesn't think the world of him. But before we get going, I want to introduce a couple people. A lady who's helped the library for so many years, and she's one of the finest ladies in lacrosse, Miss Pat Bogey. Pat? <laughs> what a good job she's done. And I'd like um, to introduce Rick Wilson, a local uh, DJ and his radio station. He does a lot to promote uh, rock and roll from the early uh, old lacrosse days, and I'd like if you were in one of Lindy's groups, I would like you to stand up and introduce yourself now to everyone. So Molly McGuire's, you can start off. <laughs> uh, my name is Dirk Weber, and I play bass in the Molly McGuire's. I'm Eric Harvey, and I'm the governor in the Molly McGuire's. Jim Davison, keyboard, Molly McGuire. Art McClure, you guitar lead that followed us in the in the Lindy bands. And Art, I think I gave you a, a couple guitar lessons, and now you could probably teach me stuff that would just sound unreal. So. But um, yes, as Anita said, we were one of the, about the fourth band of Lindsay's. There was uh, the TJs, and then there was Dave Kennedy and the Ambassadors. They were a wonderful group with Linda Hall and, and Dave Kennedy. And then there was Johnny and the Shy Guys. Well, we were the Marauders, we came along, and our claim to fame was we were the first band with the dry look. We had the dry look. All these other guys had burrow cream and wild root pink hair. But we had dry hair. We were kind of trying to be like the Beach Boys. So, so. But at any rate, our band started out just as a group of friends. The, the four Marauders all lived in a close radius of each other. I, I grew up on Sunrise Drive and the other Marauders are all in a very close, close proximity. And we all became friends playing Sandlot baseball on the old Salzer ball field where Train Plan 7 is now. That was an empty field. You could still see little foundations where some of the airport things were there. It was originally like an airmail airport. But we all were friends there playing softball or in, in baseball and then touch, uh, touch football. And um, I remember getting a guitar from my Aunt Dolores, and, and she told me, now Rick, I want you to learn this guitar, and you'll be just like Elvis. I said, Aunt Dolores, I don't want to be like Elvis, I want to be like Ricky Nelson. <laughs> so, so I started taking guitar lessons at Danny's House of Music, and at the time, Light Halls was on Main Street, and it was right next to Light Halls. Uh, I was right next to Danny's House of Music, and it was always such a thrill for me to go into light holes and see Lindy Shannon there, and they had these little isolation booths where you could listen to a record. It was like you were on the $64,000 question, and you'd go ask Lindy for a record, and if Ethel, his assistant, was nice enough to give him the record, you could go play it in the booth. And uh, we just, uh, that got me going with rock and roll. I, I remember my mom and dad were square dancers, and from a, I was a bigger family, and I always had a babysit on Saturday nights because they went uh, square dancing at Lincoln High School, at Lincoln School. And I would play Lindy's show. His little he would he would count down all the hits, and I would kind of learn the lyrics and kind of sing along. And that's what really got me going. And I thought he was such an eloquent speaker. He would tell a little bit about each artist, and you know, it kind of spurred my interest in it. And um, so I, I remember I was on the Aquinas track team freshman year, and Rick Miller and Terry Gardner were on the team, and we were fraternizing and everything. I remember the coach said, don't fraternize with those central kids, you know. <laughs> so, but we talked about getting a band together, because at the time, Terry Gardner was in the lacrosse, electrum and bugle corps, and Jim, Jim Young played bass in the orchestra, and uh, I had a guitar, and we just decided to practice. This was in the summer of 63. And we thought about, well, what, what could we 
recall yourself? Well, the big, the big uh, car that year was a Mercury Marauder. And it was like a family sedan, but it had like a 428 cubic inch engine. So it looked like you were going to church, but boy, you went in style with it. <laughs> so we decided to approach Lindy Shannon. So we went down to Light Holes, and we said, Lindy, could you come and listen to us? I, I, I think we're ready to play. And so he came to Rick Miller's house, which was over on Williams Place, which was kind of right off Ward Avenue where the, um, where the Gunners and Scott's ambulances now and that stuff. But he brought his famous tape recorder that he taped Elvis with and everything. And he kind of liked us. And I think he liked that we were young. We were all only 15. We were just starting or going to start our, our sophomore year. And he was so kind to us. And he gave us so much uh, um, confidence. And I still, I still wrote down, and I found this in my scrapbook, the things that he told what we should do to be a good band. And he said, first of all, you should really dress nice, look nice, and then you'll sound good. That just that he'll help you sound good. And he said, be nice and humble, but you're on stage just really kick butt. <laughs> and, and he said, when you take a break, don't go off on your own, but get out and mingle with the crowd. And, you know, it's principles that I used last week when I played at Oktoberfest. I still follow a lot of Lindy's uh, directives. Um, and another thing he too, he said, if you're playing a song and if you forget the lyrics, just sing anything. Well, that's been my hallmark. <laughs> and, and as I get older, it's harder to remember the words. And a lot of times they sound great, but when I hear the real words, I say, geez, that sounds good. And it makes so much sense. <laughs> but he was just like a father to all of us. And uh, while well, our band got going, Lindy was the MC for the Beach Boys that August. So he said, well, do you guys want to be a guest for when, when I MC this Beach Boys show? They're, they're like a new band from uh, California. They were at the Avalon Ballroom. So here we were, 15 year old guys, and the Beach Boys came with the U-Haul trailer and their dad, the manager, and they set up their own stuff. And uh, it was just so simple in, in, in those days. And I remember the drummer was having trouble with his drum, and our drummer, I think, went home and got a part that he needed for his top hat or something as simple. But um, Lindy just really got us going. And our first job was the team tent at the 1963 Oktoberfest. So last week when I played at the senior breakfast, and everybody was my age. Um, you know, I told them, 60 years ago I started playing in a tent, and I'm still in the darn tent playing in Oktoberfest. <laughs> so I guess you call that a uh, kind of success. But um, uh, I remember we, uh, we really took off, because I was from Aquinas, the other kids were from Central, and the kids liked us. And one of the fun things about playing last week is, we played a lot of the songs for the, for the senior citizens that we played 60 years ago at the teen tent, and boy, did they dance. Even the royal family was out there dancing. So, But we, we started playing in like so September and October. We were getting a lot of gigs, and then President Kennedy was shot and killed, and everything just stopped. It was really a national event. And so it really quieted down our band, and we really didn't get going again until after, after the first of the year. And um, as we started playing in January, uh, well then the Beatles hit like in February. So we were playing all these tunes by the Everly Brothers and Ricky Nelson and Dion and everything. And then everybody wants to hear all these Beatles songs. And they were hard. They were hard songs to learn. They were hard songs to harmonize on, to play on the guitar. But that's all the kids wanted to hear. And I remember we had to just like re regroup again and learn all those songs. And Lindy helped us with that. He'd always come and bring his uh, tape recorder to the practices. And uh, by gosh, we did learn them. Um, and there were a lot of times we'd play the whole set of Beatles songs. And the kids just loved it. And I know there was times when the Beatles had maybe five or six songs on the top ten at the same time. So, and as we got through 64, we played a lot of the little towns and... I always remember, um, you know, our dads would go with us because we were so young, and they would kind of take take turns taking us to these jobs. And then Lindy would come with us like a lot of times too. And um, 
in 65, we really started to uh, do a, a lot more uh, bigger things. And some of the memorable things I'll just share with you, we had a bus trip that the Marauders were host to go to the stadium in Minneapolis to watch the Beatles. And Lindy was with us, and, and, and all the kids from lacrosse, and we had seats right on the uh, third base side, close in. And I mean, that was really an experience. We didn't hear them that well, because everybody was just screaming and, and the Beatlemania and everything, but just to say that we were there, you know, it was really something. Um, later that year, we had uh, uh, one of the executives from this K-Bank Studios came and watched us play at Shorty's in 65, and he, he offered us that record deal and covered the whole thing, like, uh, like $500. Um, for the pressing of the records and, and everything. And so we made uh, a, a record at Twin Town. In 64, we made a record out at Cooley Records. And uh, none of the records went that well, but they sold kind of around here locally. Um, the big thing in 65 was a, a promoter saw us play at the University of Wisconsin for a big dance. And he contacted Lindy to have us open up for the Dave Clark Five, which was playing in Chicago's McCormick Place. And that was really something. We really prepared for that. That was like June 25th of 1965. And uh, it was just really something. We were in the dressing room with the Dave Clark Five, and they treated us so, so nice. And uh, we just did all the hits of 1965. You know, and the kids just loved it, the audience. There was 10,000 people in the, in, in the room that, that, that day. And there was no air conditioning and a very bad PA system. 1966, um, we, it, we were all seniors in high school. And um, we, we just, we kind of left Lindy and we were approached by the Varsity Club, a new bar that were starting in town. And Bernie Sauer and John Rotz and Wes Covington or something, or they, they approached us to be the house band. And again, as Anita said, we all knew we were going to be facing graduation with the selective service and the draft and everything, and we knew it was going to be our last summer. So we kind of left Lindy, and he gave us his blessing and everything. And we played at the varsity club, and we were one of the first bands that they had. We were like the house band. And my goodness, the stars we played with that summer, uh, Bobby Goldsboro, Everly Brothers, uh, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, uh, Turtles, uh, and they were all, late night we would all sit afterwards and visit and all these people were just so regular we just couldn't believe it because you, you know, like, like hear their records and to be so up close and personal with them was really something. It was really an opportunity that that very few people get. And it just was all a blur, it just went so fast. And the band broke up in 66, uh, but we a lot of great memories. And I remember with Lindy, um, the thing that I like to really remember about him is that he was, uh, what did they say in the Wizard of Oz when the scarecrow and the, and the lion and everything went to the wizard for their wishes and the tin man wanted a heart. And then the wizard told him, well, um, it's not how you love, but how people love you. And that was Lindy Shannon. People really loved him, because he was just a good-hearted, humble guy. And I thought the world of him. And uh, well, there we are. This, this, this is us backstage. The stage would raise up out of the ground at McCormick Place. And there was a stage left and a stage right. We were on stage left, and Dave Clark was on stage right. They were setting up their own equipment. Can you believe that? They were setting up their own equipment. The Beach Boys had their own equipment. This was in the early days. And even like when Bobby Goldsboro came to the varsity club to, to, to practice with us, uh, this Wes thought he was from one of the liquor distributors or something, or, and he scolded him for going on the floor and walking on the new floor, and here he's a star of the show that's gonna sing that night. You know, and he was such a nice guy, Bobby Goldsboro, and he, the whole time we practiced with him, we kept hearing this cricket noise, this cricket noise coming over the mic, and then he acted real, like he heard it and everything, and nothing was ever said. And then later years, when we saw his TV show, that's his trademark, making that cricket noise. 
and he never let on to us. We thought, how did that cricket get in the PA system? So what the heck's going on here? But it just shows the fun of those days. Um, the turtles asked us to continue the tour with them, but our parents said no. Thank God. You know. Um, but as we, this this is me right there. Look at that waistline. <laughs> and uh, we had we had we had pretty nice equipment in those days too. So we, but the stage would come up out of the floor to 10,000 10, screaming fans. So whew, holy smoke. That was, that was really something. Another thing about our neighborhood I'm gonna tell you that a lot of people don't know. I was in the South Side neighborhood, but out of all the guys that played touch football and baseball with us, three guys died in Vietnam. Three guys. Russell Haas lived on Losey, Jerry Rosso lived on Rosie, and, and Kenny Stripman, who lived across the street from Rick Miller, our, our lead guitar player, I mean, that shows the kind of days those were. And some of us went to college, you know, not to be draft dodgers. I was never like a protest or anything, but we, we just weren't anxious to go over there and get shot, you know. And, and I still ended up getting there after I graduated from college, but, but that's just how it was. Like Anita said, it, it broke up a lot of bands. So um, I guess that's about it for me. Does that sound that I did I go like uh, 15 minutes? <laughs> Okay, oh, thank you so much. One more story, Anita. Lindy only got mad at me once, and I mean mad. And that's, I used to like to go fishing, like my nickname was Fish. And I fished with Tom Monsoor, who's like a professional fisherman now. And we were fishing on the day we were supposed to open for the Shadows of Night. They had a hit on the charts called Gloria. And Tom Monsoor and I were up on French Island, just catching fish like crazy. The time got away from me, and I was kind of the front man for the Marauders. They did the talking, I did a lot of the singing. So I didn't show up to open, because I totally kind of got way off behind on time. And so the, the, the shadows of night had to open for themselves. Oh boy, that, it took a lot of blarney to get Lindy to like me again after that. But thank you so much, everybody. It was just so good. I don't know why I make all these sheets. I don't even pay attention to them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Heather, can we do that? There's one more audio clip. It's track 41. And this is Lindy's interviewing the Marauders um, right after they got back from McCormick Place. And the, the, we've, we've edited this, so it's an abridged version. So you'll hear some beeping. In between the spots. On the other flash drive? It's on the desktop, I think. Did you copy that? Oh, I see. Okay. I was going to say I switched them out. It's in the other flash drive. Yeah, it's the other flash drive. There isn't any swear words or anything. Uh, is there? No, not on these folks. I found some that do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Last Sunday evening, down in Chicago at McCormick Place, Lacrosse's Marauders appeared in concert with the Dave Clark Five. And this is the first chance that we've uh, been able to get together with them via tape recording and talk with them about their appearance. I know that many of you teens in the area have been very interested in this appearance, seeing that the Marauders group is from the city of Lacrosse, and, and many of you are their fans, and they're also the fans of the Dave Clark Five. So we're going to get the, the Marauders' impressions of just what happened uh, during their rather brief stay down in Chicago last Sunday. Jim, what are your fondest memories of, um, of McCormick Place last Sunday night? Why don't you tell us a little about the on-stage show? What, uh, what were your feelings as Ron Riley from WLS introduced you and the curtains opened? Tell us. Huh? Well, first of all, and, uh, we were waiting a little while before we opened the curtain when he was announcing us. We were all kind of scared and then we opened it up and all I can see is girls out there and boys <laughs> too, but all these lights are shining on us. So it was really a big thrill, and, and uh, I think the crowd accepted us very well too. Uh, needless to, uh, to say that your big moment on stage was probably the finale. Uh, I'm referring to you as an individual. Was the finale because you did sing the song? Can you tell us a little about that, uh, Jim? Well, uh, first we announced that the song we were going to play was No Satisfaction, and right off they're all 
Rolling Stones, well, we didn't announce it, but we started to play it. They knew it was sung by the Stones. And uh, after we got finished, it seems like everybody in the whole thing was just cheering and screaming. And it just seemed like everybody liked it. I'd like to talk with, Rick, uh, with Rick Provisky again for a minute. Right before the satisfaction number was done, uh, the Marauders uh, did I'm Henry the Eighth, I am, and Rick, of course, sang it. Uh, tell us what happened uh, when you finished uh, singing it through one time, Rick. Well, after we completed the number, we we asked the crowd if they'd like to sing it with us, and they agreed, and that was <laughs> quite a surprise. And we had the whole McCormick place sing right along with us with the number. That's for sure. I was backstage, and uh, and I heard I, I never heard so many voices in my life. I don't think. And of course, they apparently supposedly had the capacity of ten thousand people there that night. Some more comments over here from Jim. Yes, uh, I like the, about the autograph session is every time some of the girls come by, they make me their whisper something here and they kiss you. <laughs> 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 that's terrible, no. What do you think about that, Rick? Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no doubt about it. A good time was had by all. And um, I feel that the Marauders, uh, through all of this, uh, uh, have been very humble in the standpoint that they have not uh, been bragging and boisterous about this thing, which they certainly have reason to be. And as long as they do not do the bragging, I think that I shall, because I was there and I watched everything that happened. And uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt, although this is a group that I've been working with, I, I would truthfully say, and everybody who was there that night would say that they had the biggest response from the audience, second to the Dave Clark Five itself. So there we go, Lindy's words and the. Uh 16 year olds right at that point so that's very cool um thank you very much dr rock for sharing that with us so now we have doug who's going to talk um about the tapes and what he's been doing for the past couple of years and i've kind of introduced him already and take it away doug Get my notes. All right. Well, yes, I am the the tech geek, and uh, I was the tech geek here at the library for 13 years, and then I went on to be a tech geek somewhere else, um, and I still am. How did I come across these tapes from Lindy? Well, I'm also a record collector, and that's how I got to know Lindy. Uh, he would come into the library, I'd be in the audiovisual department, and we'd say hi, talk a little bit of records, about records. And uh, over time, I started to amass a large collection. I started to promote uh, record store or record shows here in La Crosse. And when Lindy passed, his sister got his record collection. And through whatever process she did, she contacted me. So I drove down to Beloit or Janesville and went through Lindy's record collection that she had and determined that that wasn't all of Lindy's collection. And I found out later on that his collection had been sold prior to his passing. When he found out uh, how sick he was, he had sold a bunch off um, to a store in Milwaukee. And so his sister got what was left. I went through the collection and determined it wasn't anything I was interested in, but she had talked to me about all these boxes and bags of tapes that Lindy had, and what was she going to do with them? So I said, well, I work at the library, and I think, who knows what's really on these tapes, but being that it was Lindy Shannon and he did all this work with the local bands, there's got to be something on there that's worthwhile. Maybe some radio show that he did that talks about local <laughs> events that does have a historical value to it. So I brought home in my light blue 79 Zephyr <laughs> eight boxes and a couple of bags of reel-to-reel -reel tapes and one cassette. And then I asked Anita, when I got back, this was probably 96, or, uh, not too long after Lindy's passing, I asked Anita if the library was interested in 
She said no. <laughs> I worked on her for a while. <laughs> of course, it took 20 years. <laughs> Um, I also asked around to some other agencies to see if they had interest, and, and nobody could really handle this type of project. So I hung on, hung on to the boxes, hung on to the tapes, threw up several moves, and a wife that was very understanding. <laughs> and finally I was talking with somebody from Minneapolis about the tapes, and he knew a producer up there that might be interested in re releasing some of these tapes. So we talked some more, and he listened to a couple of the tapes and decided it wasn't for him. Well, when I got the tapes back that he had listened to, it kind of got the fires burning a little more for me. So I talked to Anita and convinced her that the library wanted these tapes. <laughs> However, <laughs> being as the tapes were just in cardboard boxes, we didn't really know what was on the tapes. We had some indication there were writings on the, on the boxes, um, just say, shy guys. Okay, what about the shy guys? There were some tapes that said, Bing Crosby. Oh, okay, well, we have some ideas. But not always what's written on the box is what's inside, much like what, uh, what's on the cover of a book. So I had to listen to them all. <laughs> And there were over 200 tapes. And because with tape you have multiple f ways of recording onto a tape, you really don't know what you're going to get into when you start listening. Uh, I took two weeks off from work to really get into this project. And there was still more to do. Fortunately, the wife was on vacation, so I could stay up later than normal. <laughs> um, and there were times with, with the multiple formats, and Lindy liked to record over things. So you'd be going along, you'd be jamming to some Marauders, and then all of a sudden it would turn into a recording of Patsy Cline. <laughs> so, but you have to kind of listen to everything just to know what's truly on a tape. There was a couple that, a couple of tapes that you could listen to one channel, like the left side, and it would be just fine, but the other side would be reversed. There'd also be times where part of it would be chipmunks, but then the chipmunks also in reverse. So you, if you listen to that for long, extended periods of time, it gets very unnerving. <laughs> Um, about the tapes though, most of the tapes were in pretty good shape. But over time, tapes do deteriorate and things like the splices, the adhesive dries out, so you have to re-splice them. Usually not a big deal. Um, but Lindy, much like a lot of people back in radio, liked to take small tape reels and splice them onto bigger tape reels. So you'd have one reel that had like 12 splices on it. So just as you're getting into the song, the tape stops. So you gotta stop, splice, restart. Um, and then, then there's the dreaded shed, where the magnetic coating on a tape uh, pulls away from the plastic film. Well, online, some people have been successful in temporarily fixing this shedding of the magnetic coating by baking the tapes but my wife said, no, I'm not using her oven. <laughs> so those are still kind of in the box, waiting to get her approval uh, for that. But overall, the project was just, it was a project of love. I mean, I, once I started doing this, hearing all the great music, uh, all the great stories, uh, one that really stands out for me uh, was from December of 1955. It was when Lindy interviewed uh, an actor, Ronnie Eastman. Uh, he was on the Vic Damone show, I believe. He also performed uh, comedy, maybe some other performances. Um, 
but he was lived here in town. He lived on French Island. And I found out that another friend of mine actually delivered his uh, lacrosse tribune. Mm -hmm. But just to hear that conversation from 68 years ago, just like we're talking in front of each other right now, just as clear as day, hearing the stories that Ronnie had to say about the time, and then just hearing the other music. I knew about Johnny and the Shy Guy, I knew about the Marauders, uh, being a record collector, about the TJs, but to hear their music, some of the music are actually from the mastering studio, or their studio mastering tapes. Uh, safety, studio safety tapes, they called them. But to hear that clarity of that music without the pops and the clicks, and to hear just some of the general conversations that the bands had amongst themselves, the banter between tracks. Uh, was, it was fun to hear that, you know what, as much as, kind of like they were talking about, uh, Rick was talking about the turtles being just everyday people, you listen to their records and you kind of put them up a little higher on the shelf, you idolize them a little more, but then to hear these tapes, they're just everyday people that happens to like to fish. <laughs> That's it. Oh, I forgot. <clears throat> so all those hundreds of hours that I put in front of a television or of a computer screen, There we go. There we go. Um, it's not just recording the tapes into the computer, digitizing, but it's also uh, tagging what is on that tape. This is one of the tapes that was labeled as the Marauders. And it's not just the Marauders. It also has uh, other things that Lindy had recorded off a of record but then there are several tracks in there that are the Marauders. Um, and so from here, I'll give this information to Anita, and then she can parse out what she wants, and uh, we can uh, narrow it down to just the Marauders and the various uh, things that were on this tape. Um, but all of them require, all well, this one probably took two hours to do, just in tagging. I would record everything first, um, and then, uh, so all the digitizing first, saved them onto computer, then I wouldn't have to deal with the tapes again. There's an asterisk with that, but. <laughs> um, and then I would uh, re-listen to them all and know exactly what's on the tapes, either uh, shifting things around uh, so that songs were kind of uh, lined up. But it, was very tedious, but yet also very rewarding. Well, thank you very much, Doug and Dr. Rock today. And then we have a place where you can actually find all of our uh, material, which has a rather long URL there. but. Um, I wanted to go ahead and make sure um, we've, I've got some sheets if you're interested in being interviewed. I have people on my list already, like the Molly McGuire's. And, um, or if you've got materials that you wouldn't mind us scanning and sharing with people. And Molly McGuire's brought some outfits from the 60s and also some of their uh, photographic material. Doug has got some examples of the tapes here. Um, Dr. Rock also brought some uh, scrapbook and some other things from the Marauders. Um, and then there are a few uh, little papery things that Doug found in the, um, in amongst the tapes that uh, Lindy was using, like some band photos as scratch paper and stuff. Anyway, so if you want to write your contact information down, um, then I also have business cards there too if, if you're interested in that. So, and we're being recorded, so yay. Heather, thank you very much for working all the, the video and the audio, and that was quite a challenge in coordinating everything today. So thank you, everybody.